wanker. Hello everybody and welcome to the 2021 edition of Haas Watch, the show that documents the daily goings and the inevitable downfall of the Haas Formula 1 team. Now, if you're new to the channel and are sat there thinking what the f***ing hell was that intro, Haas Watch was a segment famous in my 2021 race reviews, mainly just for the intro being longer than the segment itself, but not today. No, today is a Christmas gift to all you Mazepin fans and the Raukali board members out there, I present you with a full fat version of the show. So strap in and let's get into that intro. Okay, no, I'm not going to make you go through that again. So, to kick off the 2021 edition of the show, I actually want to go back to 2020, when the team fielded Kevin Magnussen and a pre-singed Roman Grosjean. The 2020 car was suffering from a case of Ferrari engine, however, and any hopes of them matching their 28-point tally from 2019 were going up in smoke. Probably a bad choice of words, that, actually. Coming into the Portuguese Grand Prix, speculation was rife over which driver would keep his seat, with then Formula 2 frontrunner Mick Schumacher firmly in the running to be stealing the other for 2021. Gene Haas and Gunther Steiner were torn over who to let go, after both showed tremendous stupidity, sorry, I mean loyalty, for sticking with the team long term. In the end, though, they came to a decision. Why not just fire both of them? This came as a shock to the drivers and the F1 paddock on a whole, as everyone speculated as to who would sit in the Haas for 2021. Mick Schumacher was not much of a surprise, especially after Alpha confirmed it was keeping Lord of the Drinks and Italian Jesus for next season. But the decision made a lot of sense. Mick was on the verge of clinching the 2020 Formula 2 title, having taken two wins and eight podiums in what highlighted the super consistent season for the German. A whole host of other accolades in his junior career pointed them out as a potential future star, even if it did take him a year and a half to get to grips with each series. But there was one other small thing about Mick. The fact that he was the son of Michael f***ing Schumacher. This would put a lot of pressure and expectation on the young lad's shoulders, so only time would tell if he could keep his strong performances going into 2021. Interestingly though, Mick wasn't the first driver announced at the team for the following season. Now, depending on who you are, you'll have different answers to the question, who is the GOAT in Formula 1? For example, if you're Brazilian, you might say Ayrton Senna, and if you're British, you'll say Lewis Hamilton. Or if you're a Max Verstappen fan, you'll say Nicholas Latifi. But one man was out there prepared to prove them all wrong. And that man's name was Nikita Mazepin. <laughs> Mazepin, like Schumacher, also raced in the Formula 2 championship in 2020. And in fairness to him, he wasn't doing too badly picking up a couple of wins and six podiums which would put him fifth in the standings once the year was done. He was also a known entity in the paddock then, but not for the reasons you might expect. It's the Hungarian round of the European F3 Championship, and Kalle Mylott has just finished his job for the day and was ready to chill out and relax behind the garages. Or whatever racing drivers do, I don't know. Anyway, what he definitely wasn't expecting was the fist of Nikita Mazepin, which made contact with his face as the Briton had allegedly held up the Russian in the timed runs earlier in the day. Mazepin was awarded with a one-race ban for the incident, and it's been largely forgotten about nowadays. Yeah, we'll get to that. Kalle Mylott also happened to be racing in Formula 2 with Mick and Nikita, and within the year as runner-up after Schumacher's turn of form at the end of the season. Therefore, many expected him to be the one to make the step up instead of Mazepin, as not only was he proving to be faster than the Russian, but he also wasn't driving like it was an F1 2021 open lobby. So, why was Nikita signed instead then? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's a five-letter word starting with M and ending in Y. Now, if you guess mummy or myopi, you're just a f***ing idiot, as the answer is, of course, money. And the Mazepins have a fair amount of it. Nikita's father, Dimitri, is the chairman of the Araukum Group, meaning he's a very, very rich man, and that's all I'm going to say, is I can't afford to be sued by this guy. Dimitri's involvement in the team would end up becoming more than just paying for his son's seat, however, as his company Araukali, or Araukali, or however you meant to pronounce it, would become the title sponsors of Haas in 2021. Because if there's one way to please an American team's American fan base, to be sponsored by a Russian company. As the 2020 season wound down then and we headed off into the winter, complaints about Mazepin were flying around here and there, but in his defence, he'd managed not to punch anyone for four years, so maybe he's turned a corner. But oh no, instead, Mazepin turned out to be doing roundabouts on some woman's breasts. In December of 2020, Nikita Mazepin was in his car when he decided it was a good idea to invade the personal space of the woman on the back seat. And if you think this couldn't get any worse, he then thought it was an even better idea to film his actions and post them to social media. Turns out, sexually assaulting someone is a bit of a shitty thing to do, and so the F1 community did what they do best, and quite rightly ripped him a new asshole. With the hashtag say no to Mazepin trending on Twitter, Haas were forced to respond, 
and promised to educate the young Russian in how not to be a world-renowned twat. Nikita seemed to take this on board and published a heartfelt apology which he later deleted because reasons. This only got everyone more angry, and attempts were made to have Haas fire Mazepin with immediate effect. But remember that all-important M-word I mentioned earlier. So Mazepin kept his drive. So we're not even at testing yet, and the team are already in dangerous waters, losing fans by the bucket load, and this wasn't made any better when they launched their 2021 Formula 1 car. I imagine talks in the boardroom went something like this. Indian flag, Union Jack, Indian flag, you see? So it's a symbol of British craftsmanship and ingenuity yep. brought together, it's all there. So Would you agree that what he's done is that flag? Yes, near enough. Would you like to know what country that is the flag of? <laughs> In what many thought was initially an early April Fool's prank, the American F1 team decided to paint their American car in the Russian flag. And it's fair to say this didn't go down too well. With Russian spies now the only remaining Haas fans out there, you'd think the team couldn't torpedo themselves any further. But you'd be wrong, as they then announced that no upgrades would be added to the VF21 throughout the season whatsoever. This didn't fill the team with confidence heading into the opening round of the championship in Bahrain, where it turned out not only was the car as slow as the year before, but it also handled worse than the Tesco shopping trolley at the same time. Mad Lad Maz was the first to lose the rear of his car in second practice, the hour where everyone starts looking ahead to qualifying and the race later in the weekend. Maybe then this spin was Nikita's quali prep, as that's all he seemed to be doing throughout Q1. The second of his spins managed to frustrate new Aston Martin driver Sebastian Vettel, who would become the first in a long line to bash the Russian over the course of the season. On the other side of the garage, Mick Schumacher was faring a little better, qualifying a whole second faster than Mazepin, but still two seconds off the pace of the leading pack. And that brings us into Sunday, when Nikita Mazepin started off his F1 career by breaking a record. Now that sounds good, right? Well, that is until you find out what the record was. He was, after that weekend, the only driver in Formula 1 history to complete more formation laps than racing laps. This is going to be a long season, isn't it? Mick Schumacher was able to last a little longer than his teammate, but not to be outdone, he threw himself off the road on the safety car restart, overall finishing the race 16th out of 16 runners. At round 2 in Imola, the F1 crews had trouble getting the live feed to work in FP1. This wouldn't stop Nikita though, who was determined to show his driving talent off to the few operating cameras around the circuit. Maybe a little too determined. The Haas cars at least wouldn't fill the final row of the grid in qualifying, as fellow rookie Yuki Tsunoda helped them out a bit by rear-ending his Alpha Tauri into the wall. Mazepin also targeted Antonio Giovinazzi this week, getting in the Italian's way as he started the fast lap. So starting P18 and 19, rain in the race provided both drivers with a chance to avoid the likely drama and take home a good result for the team. Or just join in the drama for shits and giggles. Both drivers opted to take that second option. Mazepin crashing with Latifi on lap one and Mick using the safety car period to experiment with some downforce modifications on his car. If this couldn't be any worse for the mixer, his own crash blocked off the pit lane exit, forcing it to close and him from boxing to get the repairs he needed. This was at least good news for Mazepin, with Schumacher so far behind to be able to be the lead Haas for a little bit. However, fast forward to the end of the race and Schumacher would be the first Haas home, with Nikita trailing behind. 1 minute and 10 seconds behind. Maybe things would get better in Portugal then. Well, after his traditional spin in FP3, which according to Maz was Verstappen's fault for some reason, the Russian did at least have a quiet qualifying session, as Haas returned to their rightful place at the rear of the field. Mick would be able to show off a little bit come race day, as he got to have a genuine battle with a car for once, initially with his teammates, then with Latifi in the closing stages. And Nikita was battling with cars too, except it was the leaders and he was just getting in their f***ing way. Mazepin was awarded with a 5 second penalty for this, though it wouldn't matter as he was last anyway. Fast forward to Spain then, and for this race, I might as well copy and paste what I had for Portugal. Nikita spun again and spent the race holding up other cars, this time most notably Lewis Hamilton. Schumacher at least was able to out-qualify a car for the first time in his career, though both Hasses backed up the pack come the end of Sunday. It should also be noted that Mazepin finally decided to take the knee on Sunday, but had to make absolutely clear it wasn't for BLM at all. On to Monaco then, and though the racing would likely be non-existent, F1 fans were waiting on Mazepin to bring the main excitement for the weekend. The Russian had spun or crashed at every round so far, However, somehow, this turned out to be the weekend where he kept it pointing in the right direction. Mick Schumacher, however, was having less fun at the track where his father was so good. Michael won the Monaco Grand Prix five times, though was also very good at crashing there. 
sometimes deliberately. Turns out only the crashing trait was inherited by Mick, with the German crashing in second practice before one-upping his attempt on Saturday morning. This would rule him out for qualifying later in the day, meaning that for the first time, the key to the GOAT Mazepin was able to out-qualify his teammate. This order remained the same on race day, as overtaking around Monaco is about as hard as getting a woman to go on a date with you. Or is that just me? To be fair to the lads though, well done for both of them making it through the race unscathed, as I came into the weekend expecting one or both of them to yeet themselves into the harbour. What's next then? That would be Azerbaijan, and with renewed faith in his abilities, Mazepin was confident heading into the weekend, but we were back to normal soon enough. With both Haas cars three seconds off the pace, things weren't looking great for the race, but Nikita at least managed to pass his teammate and looked set to beat him for the second weekend in a row. However, Schumacher got a toe on the run up to the line and moved ahead in the dying seconds of the race. Mazepin wouldn't go down without a fight, however, deciding he would rather kill his teammate than letting him get away with that prestigious 13th place in the Grand Prix. This would be the team's best result all season, but we can't talk about Baku without mentioning how Mazepin finished ahead of Lewis Hamilton on nothing but pure pace and raw speed. Lewis Hamilton takes it away, but he lands on Ah, he... oh, just let me dream, all right? So with a bit of tension between the teammates coming into France, we learned that Mick picked up another trait from his legendary father crashing in qualifying to beat your rivals. The key to him practicing his party trick again, but despite France's kilometre-long runoffs, Schumacher still managed to find the wall at the end of Q1, which conveniently allowed him to progress to the second part of Quali for the first time in his career. Mazepin had a strong Saturday as well, finishing 18th. We just won't mention what went on behind him. So, with the team's best result of the year help them out in the race, no, of course it wouldn't. P19 and 20 once again. And before we get into the action in Styria, let's detour away from the track and into the mind of team principal Gunther Steiner for a minute. With everyone, and me included, laughing at Mazepin and his antics from the sidelines, Gunther needed a way to calm his driver down and divert his attention from all the abuse online. His solution to this was buying the Nikita a gift from the team, and also joining in with everyone else and laughing at how sh** he was. Steiner's gift was a spinning top, so now Nikita could do all his spinning off track rather than on it. Mazepin took this and repaid Gunther by going on track and spinning an FP1. At least he got it out of his system, as the rest of the weekend went by fairly smoothly. On F1's return to Austria one week later, Mazepin had a return gift for Gunther in the form of a Fox Smash door, which I'm sure became of good use later on in the year. Now a nice car, there's a few things in there. With your followers, who are your followers? Kevin Magnus? No, nobody else. <laughs> Hey, don't forget me as well. Anyway, perhaps he should have bought one for Kimi Raikkonen as well, as the Finn wasn't best pleased with Mazepin after being blocked at the final corner. Now, I do feel bad for bashing Nicky so much, so let's turn our attention to Mick Schumacher for a bit. The German had been going along quietly, still second last of everyone, but what can you expect when your car is trash and you don't fit in it properly? Around this time, Mazepin started to complain about his chassis too, claiming that it was broken and that was the sole reason why he trailed Mick in 99% of the sessions in the first half of the year. As were reluctant to replace the car, mainly due to how much it would cost and the likelihood Mazepin would quickly break it again. But after a night or two in the company of Dmitry Mazepin, Gunther had surprisingly changed his tune on the subject, promising a new chassis by F1's return from the summer break. We still had two races to run before that, however, and despite drama for both drivers early on in the season, at least they hadn't crashed into each other yet. You can see where this is going, can't you? The GOAT set another record in Formula 1, as the first driver to spin in Saturday's sprint race, having dived down the inside and collided with his teammate Schumacher. The pair would duel again the following day, with Nikita pulling admittedly an impressive move on his teammate to beat him come the end of the race. Hungary would roll around then, and after Bottas played bowling with the title protagonists, Haas were left with a golden opportunity to score some points, with five cars that would normally be ahead of them out on the spot. Don't really need that ahead of them bit, do I? Further confusion as the track dried before the restart gave Haas another chance to shoot up the grid. However, Mazepin would find himself regretting crossing Kimi in Austria, with the Finn getting his own back and wiping the Haas out of the pit lane. Schumacher also wasn't able to capitalise, though did score his best result of the season in 12th, and had a battle with a limping Verstappen, who was faster despite his car performing a strip tease thanks to Bottas here on lap 1. So, the first half of the season hadn't gone particularly well. So, well in fact, the team boss Gene Haas decided he'd rather just not show up to the races anymore. And frankly, who can blame it? But things could always be worse, right? Like at least Rich Energy and their supreme leader weren't back. Oh god. With the summer break over and a new chassis for Mazepin, the world looked on in anticipation to see if the Russians' form could come good in Belgium. 
and in fairness, it would. Mazepin found himself credited with the fastest lap at the end on Sunday. Now, yes, everyone was under safety car, but can we just give this guy a break, man? Jesus. After his spa success, Mazepin was on top of the world, and in Zanvor, it looked like he'd stopped his spinning antics too. Oh, never mind. But the main talking point from that weekend was the Hash duo battling on track again, with Mazepin remembering his favourite defensive move taken straight from Mick's father Michael. Mick was less impressed with the move, and tensions would need to deteriorate further when the F1 circus headed to Monza. After title rivals Hamilton and Verstappen went for some odd F1 car mating session at Turn 1, the Hash drivers attempted their own version at the second chicane, destroying any hopes of this budding relationship making it off the ground. Russia and everyone's favourite circuit was back for the next round, and this time Mazepin would stop his spinning for once. He then outqualified Max Verstappen, again on pace alone and nothing to do with engine changes whatsoever. Going back to Mick, he would also do well in qualifying, beating Antonio Giovinazzi and giving Alfa Romeo an excuse to drop the Italian for Guan Yu moneybags over here. Regardless, Mick's Haas would kill itself in the race, while Mazepin would finish just two laps behind everybody else. Yeah, there's only so many ways I can say that, I'm afraid. So let's be a bit more positive and talk about Schumacher's qualifying performance in Turkey, as the German managed to slip into Q2 for the second time this season, without the need of crashing this time. And the less said about Mazepin's lap, the better. With rain forecast for the race, it would be down to driver skill at the start. And though Mick did a good job here, Alonso forgot what skill meant and spun the German to the back of the field. On the bright side, at least Mick got to play a game of Jenga with Sebastian Vettel. Once you commit, you commit. Oh! Haas's second home race after Sochi came next at the Circuit of the Americas, with Nikita showing off again to whatever Haas fans remained at this point. He also conducted his other party trick by pissing Vettel off for the second time this year, before complaining cars were getting in his way and that's why he was so far off the pace. <laughs> At this point, the rest of the grid were getting rather annoyed over the Haas cars, and Perez made his feelings known by deciding to give a little love tap to Schumacher in second practice. Turns out, the team were getting pretty angry with the ongoing struggles as well, losing their cool when the teammates complained about each other in Mexico, though at least neither of them crashed. Oh, for f sake, Mick. In better news, Nikita had been staying out of trouble as of late, and it looked like people were finally starting to accept him on the F1 grid. Then he thought he saw Callum Eilat in the nightclub. With just a handful of rounds to go, the next stop was Brazil, and though Mazepin failed to make it past Q1 again, this seemed to mean more to him, and he started crying. For some reason. He would at least have a better race, beating his teammates after a battle on track for once didn't end in contact. Look, you see, I'm not just picking out all the bad things this year, it genuinely was just this bad. Qatar was a quiet race for the Haas cars, apart from Mazepin breaking his shiny new chassis and having to beg boss daddy for a new one. So let's quickly move into Saudi Arabia then. And I promise I won't make any human rights jokes this time. We were spicy enough in the season review. Anyway, after Mazepin had got his one spin of the weekend out of the way, he found himself getting a taste of his own medicine thanks to none other than hashtag blessed. The Briton held him up in FP3, and I'll give Mazepin the same credit I gave him in that weekend's comedy review. That was a fair amount of skill he showed off for not turning that into an airplane crash. Well done, Nikita Mazepin. But we were back on a street track, so that meant at some point in the weekend, Mick Schumacher was going to bin it in the wall. And he did, ripping his car to shreds at the now infamous Turn 22. This would set up the inevitable downfall of Mazepin's race as well, with the Russian not able to avoid the slowing Williams of George Russell, and so pegging the Briton on the restart. How fun getting that image out of your heads. So finally, we get to Abu Dhabi, and one of the most horrid seasons an F1 team has had to face in the modern era can finally come to a close. To celebrate, the team posed for a group photo outside the garage, though since Gene Haas was still too embarrassed to show up, they just photoshopped him in instead. While Mick did his typical thing of blending into the background, it would be the end of the road for Nikita Mazepin, with COVID preventing him from influencing the title fight, leaving it all down to poor Nicholas Latifi. But with both drivers confirmed to return to the team in 2022, and with a car they've been developing all year, who knows what further disappointments are down the road for the American slash Russian team. That's all then for this extended season review of Haswatch, and it's taken way longer than I thought, so I hope you've all enjoyed it. I'll be real with you, I tried my hardest to move away from Mazepin, but I wasn't prepared for how many times he really did 360 this year. Anyway, if you did enjoy it, make sure you drop the video a like and share it about. Uh, and get that Haswatch name out there. And also subscribe to the channel if this is your first time here. I'll still be uploading in the off season, but if you want more from me, then you can always drop a follow on Twitter or join our Discord server. All the info for that is down in the description below. And finally, I hope you all have a fantastic Christmas and also New Year. And I'll see you soon with another video, but until then, have a good one.